I think many, many students lean very heavily on note taking to their detriment because it prevents them from kind of truly engaging with the material. Alex, welcome back to the MCAT podcast. How you doing, my friend? Hello, hello. It's been a while. <laughs> <laughs> How's medical schools treating you? Oh, it is it is great. I have a uh, I have a, an anatomy exam tomorrow. Nice. This is, is uh, I feel like this <laughs> this is your first podcast appearance back on the MCAT podcast as a medical student. Previously, just just a lowly pre med. I know, I know. I've gra I've graduated, uh, and uh, I think as with all things in life, uh, you kind of as you move from one area to the next, you find yourself again at the bottom of the food chain. <laughs> such is such is the order of things. So shall it be in residency. Yes. But no, I'm absolutely loving it so far. As they say in the Lion King, it's the circle of life. Um, all right. Speaking of the circle of life, the MCAT chem fizz, which is the first section of the day for people when they're walking into their MCAT. And it's very interesting. I, I don't know if this is just anecdotally what I've seen. I, I think a lot of people struggle with chem fizz because it is the first section of the day, right? Their their brain's just not awake yet. They haven't they they haven't worked through all of their test anxiety yet. And so it, they get off to a slow start with chem fizz. Do you think there's any truth to that? Yeah, absolutely. I think I think this is an interesting case where what is often people's kind of not if not hardest, certainly most intimidating section is also like right there, like super early in the morning, like first thing. Yeah. And uh, I, I have often wondered like, oh, you know, how would the score weighting be different if it was last instead or in the middle? But, you know, I, I at the end of the day, right, I think the taking the MCAT is an experience that itself is so kind of that pumps so much adrenaline into your system that, you know, kind of I imagine many people when they take chemphys are actually pretty wide awake anyway yeah um but I, I i certainly think the fact that it's first right can certainly you know throw people off for the rest of the exam if they feel like they didn't do as well as they wanted to yeah last episode with dorothy we talked about bio biochem and why potentially students mm -hmm. struggle with that and, and there was a lot of discussion about pathways and not fully understanding ramifications of different enzymes being broken or things things happening. Where do students go wrong potentially with chem fizz as just a as just a mental block for doing well in it? I mean, yeah, I mean, building off what um, Dorothy said, I, I think that this kind of that thing of like, oh, you know, you know the material, but you don't understand it. And, and when I say understand, I don't mean like, you know, you can tell me what, you know, Pep CK does, but rather like what, you know, what can you predict three set steps downstream if its function were diminished or if it, you know, if it had a gain of function mutation, et cetera. Right. I, I think for chem phys, it's actually remarkably similar, which is um, many pre-meds approach studying for chemistry and physics uh, in undergraduate classes as very, um, very rote learning or very rote learning adjacent, which is if I memorize the formulas, if I do enough of these practice problems, if I memorize the sequence of steps, then I don't, you know, then they, you know, in a sense, you can get a good grade, right? You can, you can get an A in the class. Uh, I mean, the fact that you can get an A with that approach, I think, is perhaps a you know separate criticism of the <laughs> educational system. But um, you know, I, I think for many people that doesn't end up serving them very well on the MCAT, which will almost never ask you a you know an, uh, will almost never ask you a difficult chem phys question that resembles precisely one that you've seen before. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it requires working with the concepts rather than any kind of individual memorized approach. So what is your recommendation for someone who's studying for the MCAT right now to learn how to approach their studying that will support them on the MCAT for that understanding? Mm -hmm. um, the big one, the big one, actually, for chem phys that I always tell people is that I think the chem phys is the section that is the least conducive to effective note taking, where I, I think many people and you know, many students when they're studying for the chem phys section, especially for you know for chemistry and physics, right, they're very, very concerned with 
you know, do I, you know, have I got this particular reagent or reaction memorized? Or, you know, do I have all of these equations memorized? And I think notes is actually, for many people, like the kind of initial starting place where I kind of start to kind of dig into this, um, you know, flawed approach, where I think many, many students lean very heavily on note taking to their detriment because it prevents them from kind of truly engaging with the material. Uh, the first the first thing I often recommend to people is like, look, you know, when you're studying physics or chemistry next time, you know, if you're watching, say, one of our blueprint modules or if you're, you know, reading a chapter in a textbook, even if you're watching, a, you know, a Khan Academy video, right, don't take notes, train 100 percent of your attention on the screen and focus on understanding it. And, you, you know, you'll know that you've understood it when you can perhaps anticipate what's going to come next or you, you know. If I were to ask you, like, okay, but, you know, what if I were to change the scenario here? Like, you know, let's say I put the block on an inclined plane now. Like, what does the free body diagram look like? And, you know, what would happen in this particular case with or without air resistance? You know, I, I think once you can, once you notice your mental model of the concepts, like, start being able to be, like, freely applied to different situations, uh, you know that you're on the right track inclined planes you just had to go there didn't you just had to go there <laughs> it's, a, it's a classic it's a classic of the section yeah although yeah. i don't know how how would the mcat phrase this nowadays uh you know a man is standing on an inclined plane you know got to make it relevant to to yeah. bio to biology somehow of course of course um but yeah anyway <laughs> um so let's talk about timing of the section how often do you see timing come into play with chemphys? All the time. I reckon it and cars are the two toughest sections for most people on timing. Um, and, you know, I think with good reason, right? I think especially, right, um, many people are particularly concerned with timing when it comes to uh, math problems on chemphys, right? They, I, partic I think there's a great, great worry, you know, and in many cases, you know, justifiedly so at the beginning of your of their prep where you're like, I'm going to be there and I'm going to need time to work through a difficult math problem and I'm just not going to have enough time or I'm going to take, you know, 10 minutes to solve it and then I'll run out of time on chemphys. I think for many people it is the, it is the kind of toughest section to time manage. Um, my approach to timing in chem phys when people is actually the same as my approach to timing in all of the other sections which is uh, for anyone who wants to improve on timing you need to see where your time is going right in the same way that if someone said to you like i have difficulty with bio biochem that you know the first question you know it, you that you know they should ask themselves is well you know what type of bio biochem problems or what subjects or what skills you know, the same is true in chem phys and in, and, in, and in this problem of timing more broadly. Where is your time going? You know, are you spending too much time reading passages? Are you spending too much time working through math problems? Are you, you know, not spending too much time on the passage, but then are rereading it two or three times and doubling the word count that you have to, you know, that you actually have <laughs> to make it through, etc. Yeah. Right. And once you get to some sense of that, you can say, well, you know, you can get to the underlying skill that you're not applying quickly yeah. and practice that directly. Because humans, as with all things, right, as we practice things, we get faster at them. Hopefully. Um, hopefully. Hopefully. The, the question that pops into mind for me is, how am I supposed to know why I'm struggling with time, right? Mm -hmm. and if, if I'm a marathon runner and I hire a coach to help with my running mechanics, they're able to watch me run and go, oh, I see what's going on. Your stride length is too far. You're you're slowing down with every step, whatever. If if I'm just hiding in my basement and taking full length exam after full length exam and I'm continuing to struggle with chem phys and the timing, when you say, oh, are you, you're, you're taking too long reading a passage, how am I supposed to know I'm taking too long reading a passage? That's, that, is a, that is an excellent question. <laughs> the... Um... You know, I, I think uh, you know, Ryan. As as you as you so often as you so often tell students coming to you for advice, you know, you need to do some reflection here, uh, which is, um, and I think particularly for uh, on the MCAT, right? The you know, there is a lot we can gain from self observation. You know, of course, 
you know, I suppose as with hiring a personal trainer, right, you could hire a tutor. And in a sense, that's often what tutors do, right? They help you figure out where you need to focus your time and attention uh, and how to do that most effectively. But, you know, there's a lot of this that we can get out ourselves and, you know, that mainly comes in our review process, mm. right? That is, you know, I think insufficient review is um, probably the biggest mistake that people make on the MCAT. And it's not just about the content, right? In your review, you can say like, oh, you know, looking at my, you know, let's say in, for example, in the Blueprint Analytics dashboard, right? If you take the free diagnostic or the free full length one, right? You can see how much time you spent on every question, right? If you look at the first question of every passage, it'll tell you how much time you spent reading the passage, right? And that kind of really targeted review, like what, you know, I have this many seconds in the chem phys section, where are they going? Right. Once you get that, you can you, know, you, you, you we have some sense of kind of how long we have to spend overall and we can work backwards from there. Like, you know, where can the where can the seconds more easily be trimmed versus where might they be harder to gain? Yeah, I, I was just thinking that. And, and so the blueprint MCAT analytics for your full length exams, they do tell you how long you were reading a passage. Is it like time to open up the passage and then time that you clicked the first question is that like the assumption of how long it took you to read the passage or is it just the passage in general took you this long to read it and finish the questions so it's um i to get a sense of how long it takes to read the passage the um uh, you can look at the amount of time that it took you to kind of quote unquote complete question one of each passage, okay. right? The first question. So I suppose it is, it's actually you're adding the time it took you to read the passage to the time it took you to answer the first question. Okay. But you know, and for what it's worth, I mean, that's a, you know, that is a particularly easy way to get that kind of information. But yeah. you know, if you're taking a different practice test, it's entirely possible that you just have a little stopwatch over on the side that you tap every time you complete a question. Yeah. Definitely. It's a, it's some good analytics uh, that I think, uh, I, I love data. Like I, I'm not a diabetic or pre-diabetic, but I I've been wearing a, a continuous glucose monitor. Cause like, <laughs> I just want to see like the foods that I eat, how do they affect my body? And it's, it's very interesting to see like that data helps me make decisions throughout the day of like, do I want to eat that chocolate? <laughs> do I want to eat that cookie? Do I... And sometimes I do. And then I see it on my, on my uh, insulin and, and, and sugar reports, but Hey, whatever. Like I, I made that decision knowing I, I, I was informed. And so mm -hmm. being able to reflect back on your chem phys section or any parts of the MCAT and go, I have data here that shows me I'm taking too long reading the passage I need to do something about that. I need to reflect where where am I going too long? Is it as you mentioned, right? You're you're doubling or tripling the amount of words that you're reading because you're rereading. Is it you're overanalyzing the images and the graphs and stuff like that, or is it that you just are a slow reader and you just need to hurry up? <laughs> um, so lo lots of decisions to make based on data. That's why I really like the the Blueprint MCAT. Uh, analytics with their full length exams because it gives you a lot of that information to make better decisions about your journey. Yeah, and I think that's so important, right? So much of this process is taking these broader problems and breaking them down into their components, right? Which is like, you know, I'm I'm running out of time is kind of one symptom that could have, you know, 30 possible different diagnoses. Yeah, yeah. You know, and I, as I often say to students, right, it's like, oh, you know, if a patient comes in with, you know, untreated, you know, type one diabetes, like, you know, deep into ke in ketoacidosis, right, if you diagnose it as high blood pressure, and, you know, prescribe them a blood pressure pill, right, it won't cure the problem. <laughs> but you I know, gave you medicine. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, as with all things, the treatment has to be targeted to the diagnosis for it to have the effect that you want. Yeah, shocker, shocker. Okay. Are there any specific resources for the chem phys section that you think are just easy wins for students? Yeah. So, I mean, I would certainly, I would certainly, you know, start with the the easy ones, the gimmies, right? The, you know, of course, Khan Academy is great for content, right? Of course, if you, you know, if you have a Blueprint subscription, um, you know, Blueprint has a vast array of QBank questions, but, you know, even in available entirely for free, right? There's the, uh, the half length diagnostic that, um, I believe you're still currently working through on the MCAT podcast. Um, we're, we're done with it now. Oh, are yeah. you? Oh, my goodness. We finished. We finished. Yeah. 
Um, <clears throat> but then there's also, you know, of course, there's the free full length one, there's loads of flashcards. Again, you know, what resources people you decide to avail yourself of first and then what order will depend on what particular skills that you want to work on. Yeah. And um, but certainly, you know, starting with the free resources and then progressing to something that is, you know, conducive to your situation and to your, you know, financial condition, et cetera, I think is always the best way to go. Right. Kind of as you know, as with ever, as with all things pre-med, right, there is no correct path, only the, you know, only the best path for you. Yeah. You, you talked about the flashcards blueprint has their space repetition platform. Anki obviously is what most students will will know and, and potentially use. Most students are just going and downloading a, a deck and using that. They're not creating their own flashcards. Is that like, like easy step number one? Right? It's 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 simple, but it's not easy to go and create your own flashcards. Will that help with some foundational knowledge there? Interesting. I I, I sense that we might disagree on this. That, that do you are you, are you a bit are you a big fan of creating your own flashcards? I don't know. Every other MCAT person I talk to says creating versus just using is the the creation is where a lot of learning takes place as well. Mm. I, I for me, I for me, I think it's really context dependent. Where if a, I think flashcards are really, really good at a. You know, they are the treatment to a very specific diagnosis, mm. which is you know there is some content that I conceptually understand. Right. When I look at it on a page, it makes perfect sense. But like I need to retain it from an information perspective. I often think like the kind of ideal case for flashcards is something like amino acid structures, you know, and the one letter and three letter codes. Whereas like, you know, people understand amino acids and what they are. You know, that's not the issue. The issue is like, can I store it in my brain, which is not good at remembering things? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I think flashcards are like the perfect solution to that because they are at their core like memorization aids. Yeah. And for something like amino acids, I, I think often many people say like it's really important to make your own. But actually, my my, my uh, you know make you know make your own because it helps you memorize things better. And I'm like memorize things better. That's what the flashcards are for. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And and so you know for something like amino acids, I actually say I would have no problem with downloading an external deck. I would just probably use some caution and maybe cross-reference them with a trusted resource before you start yeah. drilling that information into your brain. Yeah. Um, for something more conceptual, I often think like metabolism is like the anti-flashcard topic. Uh, often what people, uh, what students instead actually need to work on there, right? Their diagnosis is actually, you know, one of comprehension or one of like how do all of these parts fit together? Uh, and for something like that, you know, making your own flashcards can be very, very, very helpful. But even something broader, like making a study sheet or like a concept map to see how it all fits together, right? That's like a, you know, a different kind of diagnosis for which a slightly different solution can be really helpful. Yeah. Final words of wisdom for the student who needs to improve their chem phys section. Um, many people who come to this, who come to the MCAT are... I think can I think people often come to this section with a lot of pre-existing conceptions about how they are or are not good at physics and chemistry and math and all of that, or you know, logarithms without a calculator, et cetera. Right? I think many, many people approach this test with the default mindset of, you know, this is a skill that I am bad at. And I think what's true for essentially everyone is that that thought that loop running in your mind right is never as true as you think it is and is often pushes you away from doing the kind of practice that you need to do to improve right it is a skill all of this are uh, you know it is applications of skill like any other application of skill on the mcat right and you know with effective practice and careful review you will improve at it too.